This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click the link in the description to get 83% off for two years plus three months for free. Can't Help Myself is a piece of installation art by Chinese artists Sun Yuan and Peng Yu, which was first presented at the Guggenheim in 2016 and has gone on to be exhibited at several other prestigious art shows until being decommissioned in 2019. The piece consists of an industrial robot arm fitted with a custom-made shovel and a series of camera sensors placed in a glass box and programmed to contain the spread of a red liquid. But if you've seen this piece, it's probably not because you were at the 2019 Venice Biennale exhibition, but because of a post about it that went viral on Facebook and TikTok in November 2021, and more recently on Twitter about a week ago. The post reads, No piece of art has ever emotionally affected me the way this robot arm piece has. It's programmed to try to contain the hydraulic fluid that's constantly leaking out and required to keep itself running. If too much escapes, it will die, so it's desperately trying to pull it back to continue to fight for another day. The saddest part is, they gave the robot the ability to do these happy dances to spectators. When the project was first launched, it danced around, spending most of its time interacting with the crowd since it could quickly pull back the small spillage. Many years later, as you see it now in the photo, it looks tired and hopeless as there isn't enough time to dance anymore. It now only has enough time to try to keep itself alive as the amount of leaked hydraulic fluid became unmanageable as the spill grew over time, living its last days in a never-ending cycle between sustaining life and simultaneously bleeding out figuratively and literally as its hydraulic fluid was purposefully made to look like its actual blood. The robot arm finally ran out of hydraulic fluid in 20 2019 slowly came to a halt and died and I am now tearing up over a friggin robot arm it was programmed to live out this fate and no matter what it did or how hard it tried there is no escaping it spectators watched as it slowly bled out until the day that it ceased to move forever saying that this resonates doesn't even do it justice in my opinion created by Sun Yan and Peng Yu they named the piece can't help myself what a masterpiece what a message damn that's deep as hell bro the original post was made by a musician named James Crick Parr, who looks like a bar mitzvah DJ who keeps getting fired for trying to convert kids to Mormonism. He looks like a gnome that sneaks into your house when you're asleep to clean your bong. <laughs> he looks like if someone made a Funko Pop of a Disney adult. Anyway, Crick's post blew up on Instagram, where, along with a lot of people who really connected with it, he also got some very funny responses. It's a freaking robot! Get over it! It's not life! This is a stupid art. And yet, it hasn't changed anything. But also, from there, it became a copy pasta that got shared around a lot on Facebook, including in some very weird places, like a page called UK Cop Humor, where it was posted with the caption, Sounds a lot like being a police officer. <laughs> Which seems like a bit of a stretch to me. At no point in the piece does the robot beat its wife. It then took off on TikTok, where footage of the piece was set to sad music, and then eventually Twitter, where an engagement farm posted it as a thread, and I found out about it. For those of you not cursed with a Twitter presence, I think that it's the part of the internet where people are the meanest about things that matter the least. And so, Twitter users were not about to stand for this cringe yet innocent thread about a sad robot. The first thing that got brought up was the fact that the copy pasta misunderstands some key parts of the work. The red liquid being moved around isn't lubricant. In fact, apparently that kind of robot arm doesn't need lubricant at all. The liquid was just fake blood, which robot arms also have no use for. They only want real human blood. But also, and I think a little bit more interestingly, people were pointing out that the artist's intent wasn't to show the futility of life and the passage of time, but rather to make a political statement about technology, surveillance, and the inherent violence of borders. Now, I don't want to frame this whole thing as totally ridiculous. I think that it's fairly reasonable to say that it's bad that a work of art made by people of color with a pointed and I would say important political message becoming popular only because a white guy misunderstood it as being about stopping to smell the roses, thus robbing it of its political meaning. But also, 
everything else aside, I think that it is just bad to say that someone is wrong in how they experience art. And so for this month, I thought I'd take the chance to flex some muscles that I don't get to use very often and class things up around here a bit with some critical theory. Also, just I like the idea of a cool, fresh out of college, high school English teacher who tries to make learning fun and get through to these kids by relating everything to terminally online Twitter drama. And that's why the Montagues and Capulets were just like present day anarchists and tankies, right? This is the point in Lord of the Flies when Jack goes from milkshake duck to full blown debate bro. So we can see now how the Bean Dad thread perfectly matches the structure of the Odyssey. Yes, question. In this video, we're gonna talk about the death of the author. I was told to worship holy things. Always keep the evil far from me. I've been back and forth behind the scene. Hoping that one day I'll find what I need. One thing to get out of the way here is clarifying what we mean by death of the author. A lot of the time when I see it brought up, it's in the context of how we enjoy art that's made by terrible people. This is usually referred to as separating the art from the artist. But the idea of the death of the author isn't as much a question of the ethical production and consumption of art as much as a question of the extent to which we privilege the author of a work of art's intent, if we do so at all. While these two things do obviously overlap in some ways, I think that whether or not we think that an author has the final say on the meaning of a work of art they create doesn't really give us a clear answer to the question of the ethics of consuming that art. My personal take on this is that consuming art made by a bad person does not, in and of itself, make you a bad person. Now, there is a difference, though, between enjoying art and supporting its creator, especially when they're still alive, and you should absolutely avoid giving money to bad people, regardless of whether or not you continue to enjoy their work. And luckily, we live in a time when it's never been easier to avoid paying artists. Also, I personally think that the question of separating the art from the artist kind of misses how people actually experience art. I don't think many people only think about one or the other, but some complicated combination of the two. And so it becomes a personal decision where someone draws that line. This is especially true of art that's extremely personal. It's very difficult to separate the art from the artist with someone like Woody Allen when so many of his movies are about a self-insert dating a much younger woman. Or, for instance, I, like most comedians, used to be a massive fan of Louis C.K. in the early 2010s, but after the revelations came out about him being a sex pest, I can't really look past that to enjoy his work. That said, I'd also say that having a view of a work of art that's informed by aspects of the author's life is not totally inconsistent with disregarding authorial intent. I would guess that Louis' intent when he made a lot of his stuff wasn't as a comment on his own sex crimes, but that doesn't change the fact that, at least to me, his personal life comes through in the work regardless of whatever he might say his intentions were. This brings me to one of the problems I have with people bringing up death of the author, which is that I'm generally not totally sure what exactly they mean. There are lots of different schools of literary analysis, all of which tend to place varying emphasis on the intentions of a work's creator. By the way, I graduated from university in 2016 and immediately untaught myself how to read, so forgive me if I'm a bit rusty here. I'm not old, you're old. 
So to be sure, there is a school of thought known as intentionalism, which very much views authorial intent as absolute. Intentionalists will revise their reading of a work if, for example, a new manuscript is uncovered or the author tweets that people in her story used to shit on the floor. While this isn't a very popular perspective anymore, it has been recently enjoying a bit of a contrarian comeback, but we'll come back to this later. Another school of analysis is formalism. Classical formalists judge a work of art based on its formal elements without looking at outside contexts or conditions. Drawing on people like Aristotle, who wrote very specific guidelines for how to write different kinds of stories, formalists would basically grade a work for how well it adhered to what was seen as correct. Once again, I'm not really an expert in any of these. This is just a general overview, so please don't flunk me, formalists. But also, formalism isn't all bad. For instance, Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett can be really interesting when looked at through a formalist lens, since in the play, Beckett essentially does the exact opposite of how Aristotle says to write a play. That said, if you weren't tipped off by the fact that the nicest thing I could say about it is that it's cool when someone shits all over it, I think formalism kind of sucks. <laughs> It was, however, updated in the mid 20th century with what's called new criticism. New criticism gets rid of all the objective standards, but kept the idea that everything you need to understand a work of art is contained in the art itself. It's not quite accurate to say that new critics don't care about an artist's intentions so much as they think that you can discover those intentions by close reading the work instead of like, ever talking to the artist. There are also structuralist schools of thought, which are very complicated, but most basically, structuralists are interested in big theories that explain everything and understand art by seeing it as almost an emergent phenomenon expressing that underlying structure. These are people like Northrop Fry who come up with complicated theories that try to explain all art and then fit any work into that theory. One example of this would be someone I've talked about a lot on this channel, Frederick Jameson. In his book, The Political Unconscious, Jameson fuses Marxist and Freudian analysis, arguing that economic relations assert themselves subconsciously through art. Jameson argued that all art should be historicized and that the best form of historical analysis was Marxism. And so for Jameson, all art should be understood as an expression of the economic and political system under which it was produced. Hence the title of his follow-up book, Postmodernism or The Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. An example of this kind of reading could be something like the paintings of the group of seven a bunch of Canadian painters who made extremely iconic landscapes of the Canadian wilderness. Now, I'm not really sure how popular they are outside of Canada, but I'm certain that any Canadians watching this have seen some of their work. They're basically the Wu-Tang Clan of Canadian landscape painters. Warren Harris is Ghostface Killer. And so if we're doing a Marxist slash decolonialist reading of them, we might point out how the group of Seven's landscapes are beautiful, but empty. And so perhaps part of the reason why their work is so celebrated in Canada, as opposed to someone like say, Kent Monkman, is because they perpetuate an idea that Canada was empty prior to colonialism. What's notable here though, is that this reading does not care at all about the intentions of the artists, but rather the nature of the system that they're a part of. And speaking of the mode of production under which a work of art is produced, let me tell you about Surfshark VPN. If you're watching this video, hopefully you're interested in art criticism and asking these kinds of interesting questions. One question that I didn't get to in this video, but is very important is, is anime art or man's greatest folly? Well, you're not going to be able to find the answer to that question without access to Japanese Netflix. And that's where Surfshark comes in. 
Surfshark VPN essentially creates a private internet connection for you, either at home or on the go, which allows you to get around region-locked content, as well as keeping your data and online activity safe and secure. Not only that, but Surfshark also offers a clean web feature, which blocks ads and trackers. And right now, if you click the link in the description, go to surfshark.deal slash we're in hell, or use the promo code we're in hell, all one word, no apostrophe at checkout, you'll be able to get Surfshark for 83% off for two years, plus an additional three months for free. But as much as we here at We're in Hell love a good stroll through the various genres of literary criticism, what even is this channel anymore? This is all a little bit unfair, since when most people are talking about the death of the author, they're talking about reader response criticism and Roland Barthes, who coined the phrase death of the author in an essay by the same name. In the essay, Barthes first delivers a bit of historical context, showing how the concept of the author is a somewhat recent invention. In ancient societies, for instance, the role of a, uh, let's say, storyteller it's kind of hard to talk about this without saying the word author, but saying author would kind of defeat the point. By the way, lots of postmodern theorists get shit for being incomprehensible, which I think is pretty unfair, since if you're trying to critique concepts like reason and language while necessarily having to use reason and language, you're going to have to write in a pretty complicated way. Anyway, in these societies, a storyteller would be less seen as the creator of a story and more as the conduit through which the story flowed. This, Barthes argued, was more correct, since art is not created just by one person, but by a combination of history, culture, material conditions, and perspectives that continue to evolve long after the work is finished. From here, things get a little bit complicated, but let's see how I do. Barthes argued that instead of seeing art as having an author, we should see it as having a scripter. Part of this was to disrupt the connection between author and authority, both stemming from the same Latin root. But also, for Barthes, a scripter is different from an author in that a scripter isn't really a person. So, there's a school of philosophy called contextualism or performativism that looks at, among other things, how there are certain things that you do just by saying that you'll do them. A good example of this is promises. Unlike how me saying I'll do the dishes is not the same as actually doing them, if I say the words, I promise to do the dishes, then that's it, I've promised to do the dishes. Now. Excuse me while I go do the dishes right now and also make sure to organize the Tupperware this time instead of just throwing them all in. I, I'm sorry, my roommate wrote this part. Should probably actually go do that though. So this is sometimes called a speech action. And that's what Barthes thinks that a scripter is. Rather than the author being a person who exists in a point in time with a history attached to them, when Barthes says that the author is dead, he's saying that instead we should see them as a scripter, a sort of linguistic construct only existing as a snapshot of the person in the moment when they created the art that we are experiencing. Barthes goes on to argue that since art is this confluence of meanings and contexts, the place where these contexts most come together is in the mind of the reader. The reader is the space on which all the quotations that make up a writing are inscribed without any of them being lost. A text's unity lies not in its origin, but in its destination. But Barthes went even further by arguing against critics too, saying that when we think of art as having an answer that we can solve, we limit the experience of art by focusing on solving it rather than enjoying it. Now, this is something I kind of disagree with, but I think it highlights something that's really great about Barthes, which is just how concerned he is with people enjoying art. While I think that to a degree, analyzing art can definitely lead to enjoying it more and on a much deeper level, 
How do you not love a guy who cares this much about people not intellectualizing art to death and instead just vibing with it? I'll tell you how, by coming back to intentionalism. There is plenty of disagreement even in this field as to what extent one should only look to the author, but one school of thought goes all the way and it's called extreme intentionalism, or sometimes actual intentionalism, which I guess it's good since unlike extreme intentionalism, it doesn't sound like an off-brand sports drink from the 90s, but also that is for sure a dick move to all the other intentionalists out there, eh? Probably the foremost thinker in this field is a woman named Kathleen Stock, who in her book Only Imagine Fiction, Interpretation, and Imagination makes a rigorous case for extreme intentionalism, arguing that art should be understood as a set of instructions from the creator telling the viewer what to imagine. Now, some of you, particularly in the UK, may have bristled a little at me bringing up Kathleen Stock, and that's because Judith Butler's evil twin over here is probably less known for her contributions to literary criticism, such as they are, and more for her vocal opposition to trans rights. While Stock has said that she doesn't have a problem with trans people, and has even gone so far as to say that they should be free from violence, harassment, or any discrimination, ally of the year over here, am I right? She has also said that she thinks that Trans women are still males with male genitalia. Many are sexually attracted to females, and they should not be in places where females undress or sleep in a completely unrestricted way. Ugh, what a fucking loser. Get a life, Kathleen. <laughs> She's also been outspoken against proposed changes to the Gender Recognition Act and is trustee of the LGB Alliance, a group that, despite claiming to be just looking out for the best interests of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, has been surprisingly happy to partner with right-wing and extremely homophobic institutions like the Heritage Foundation and the Witherspoon Institute, joined by their shared hatred of trans people. Things came to a boiling point in 2021 when students at the University of Sussex, where she was a professor, began protesting her. What followed was the most British shit I've ever heard. In the many, many mainstream media appearances Stock has done since apparently being silenced, she talks about how the protesters bullied her off campus, and so when I looked into it a little bit, I was expecting to see students fucking shit up. but. Not really. It was all very tame, and the university supported her every step of the way. First, students put up two posters on campus factually saying that she was a turf, and the university immediately took them down. Then there was a peaceful protest outside of one of her lectures that didn't even really disrupt the class. And then the final straw was apparently a pathway stock took to work that the students completely covered in posters that were aimed against her. And like, I can definitely understand how that would make someone feel uncomfortable. In fact, that was probably the point of doing it. But this is all being framed as like bullying and cancel culture. But like, I'm sorry, even if you disagree with the aims of the students, firstly, get fucked in trans rights, but also, if you care about freedom of speech, it seems to me like those students were facing far more censorship than Stock ever was. Now, we'll come back to Stock's theories in a moment, but before we do, let's talk about someone called Derrida. Jacques Derrida was a French Algerian philosopher who, to say the very least, is incredibly contentious. Some would even argue that he isn't a philosopher at all, owing in part to his writing being borderline completely unreadable. Derrida is the most famous philosopher in the school of criticism known as post-structuralism. By the way, this is pedantic, but when people talk about postmodernism, they're usually talking about post-structuralism. So next time someone calls you a postmodern neo-Marxist, you'll have the perfect comeback. So you're welcome. Although Derrida didn't create this school of thought, arguably that honor belongs to Friedrich Nietzsche in his essay On Truth and Lies in a Non-Moral Sense. 
This isn't actually important for what we're talking about. I just like bringing it up because A, it's funny to point out that every Chud's favorite philosopher actually created the theory they blame all the world's problems on. And also, if you're interested in learning more about post-structuralism, that essay is a really good and accessible place to start. Anyway, post-structuralism is unbelievably complicated and I'm not gonna try to do a full explanation here. Most basically, where structuralists would look for an overarching structure to explain the nature of like the relationship between a sign and its signifier, post-structuralists would instead say that that relationship doesn't exist at all. Derrida argued that nothing exists outside of context and advocated for a method that he called deconstruction to highlight the contradictions in a philosophical or critical theory. Now, for any of you who are just learning about this stuff for the first time right now, it's totally fine if you don't agree with all of Barthes or Derrida's theories here. I certainly don't, but I'm willing to bet that most of you aren't mad about them either. That was not the case when people first heard about this stuff, though. The rise of these new theories like reader response criticism or post-structuralism caused a massive schism in philosophy and art criticism all over the world. The most famous and emblematic case of this was when Derrida delivered a lecture at Oxford and was famously and brutally rejected for it. The official reason for this is because the old head analytic philosophers at Oxford didn't agree with Derrida's continental philosophy, which I guess in this analogy would be mumble rap. Nobody appreciated Derrida's repetitive triplet flow. But in his book, Someone Called Derrida, John Shad thinks that it might be something else. Someone Called Derrida, an Oxford mystery, is a very strange book. It's sort of a biography of Derrida, as well as a close reading of probably Derrida's strangest book, The Postcard from Socrates to Freud and Beyond, as well as just a reflection on the life and death of John Shad's father. Something Shad points out is that Oxford rejecting Derrida probably also had something to do with the fact that Derrida was a leftist Jew. Shad highlights how anti-Semitism and anti-communism run deep at Oxford and Cambridge, and notes how the two schools were never bombed during World War II, since Hitler had intended for them to continue as prestigious places of learning after he'd won the war. But Shad goes even further, and in a particularly spicy take, asks if Rather than this just being a problem with Oxbridge, maybe analytic philosophy itself is in some ways linked to fascism. Let's come back to Kathleen Stock now. In her book, I think that she does a good enough job of arguing that a work of art being a set of instructions from its creator is, at the very least, a valid way of viewing art. What she doesn't really do, though, is provide a very good case for why we need to follow those instructions. At one point, she even just waves away the idea that a reader of a work contributes meaning to it as like completely absurd. Now, it's probably way too late to say this, but I'm really not trying to just poison the well here and call Kathleen Stock a fascist. Nor do I think that any of you are fascists just by virtue of the fact that you might like intentionalism or analytic philosophy. That said, I think that there is something to John Shad's question. For instance, analytic philosophy is generally concerned with finding universal truths, and so any aberration tends to be labeled as deviant. I also don't think that it should be that surprising that someone who seems to view the author's authority as almost self-evidently absolute would also turn out to have some reactionary views in other areas. Regardless of what you think of the content of Barth's or Derrida's theories, I think it's extremely clear that for both of them, a central goal of their work was to democratize philosophy and art. There's absolutely nothing wrong with taking issue with 
any of these theories, but I think that if your instinctive response to all of them is always outrage or revulsion, I do think that that definitely says something about you. All right, we're done with the weird shit, and now it's time for me to give my dumbass take. <laughs> After going through a few of the many schools of criticism, it's time to finally pucker up and decide which one I want to kiss. It's gonna be pretty boring. Uh, I think that they're all good in some way or another. <laughs> uh, call this a cop out, but I think this may just be because this was very much drilled into my head while studying sociology. But every interpretive lens has uses and shortcomings. They all let you spot something that others can't and also miss things that others don't. Furthermore, I think that rather than picking one type of analysis and saying anyone else is wrong, the thing that makes art criticism interesting is looking at the multiple ways you can understand a work as well as how those ways interact. Let's come back to Can't Help Myself now and try and put all this together and do just that. One question that might be useful to ask is if Crickt is wrong about his understanding of the meaning of the piece, then why does the appearance of the piece seem to support his reading so much? Surely there are clearer ways of representing borders or surveillance, right? If we start by looking again at the official description of the work, it's true that Crick was wrong about the liquid being lubricant, so we can definitely give him a cinema sin there, but some interesting parts that do support his reading are that the machine's movements were very intentionally designed to imitate human movements, and the robot did slow down and eventually stop working. I think that given that, it's absolutely fair to anthropomorphize the robot and therefore see its eventual breaking down as in some way synonymous with or representative of death. With regards to the blood then, this might be a stretch, but maybe we could see the robot as also believing that it needs to keep scooping the blood in order to stay alive, even though it's actually causing it to break down faster. I think that, intentional or not, the fact that the robot, supposedly this symbol of state violence and surveillance, comes off as so human complicates the meaning of this piece. There are lots of conclusions you could draw from this, but one explanation might be to look at the circumstances under which the art was produced. There have rightly been discussions about this piece having been essentially distributed via clickbait and the effect that's had on the meaning of the work, but I think it's also worth pointing out that this wasn't cheap to make, and the Guggenheim, where it was initially displayed, like any art museum, isn't a particularly subversive institution. Part of this convolution that we're seeing with this might be because elite art institutions aren't really inclined towards producing scathing anarchist art, and are much more geared towards producing art that flatters the sensibilities of the wealth criminals who fund these institutions. Honestly though, I, I don't know, I'm an idiot who wrote all of this at 4 a.m. I know this is corny to say, but comment what your reading is. I would genuinely love to read that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think that ultimately my conclusion here is stop being weird and trying to own people with art criticism. I think that the mark of a good piece of art is that it invites lots of different readings. Having these discussions and disagreements and learning from the different ways people can see a work of art is great. It's a key part of how to enjoy and experience art. Or, I don't know, maybe it isn't. Roast me in the comments if you think that I should stay in my lane and only talk about sociology. It's up to you. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Just one more drink and then I should be on my way home. I'm not entirely sure what you're talking about. I've had a really nice time, but my dogs need to be fed. I must say that in the right light, you look like Shackleton. Come on, Alephusa, swat the sweet, come see, come stop. Yes, a penguin taught me French back. I could show you the way 
shadows call the night snow Ice breaking up on the bay Off the last of the cold Light falling over the poles Every longitude Up to your frostbitten feet Oh, you're very sweet thing 